So I have a deal with our kids. Anytime I talk about any of our children, they have to be in the audience. I pay them $5, so um, Sam remind me later I owe you some money. So on our son Sam, speaking of, was a year old. I had one of those like backpacks to, to, to carry him around so I could do what I needed to do at the same time, like have my child close by. And one morning I remember Paula was away and I, I had some work to get done and some things to take care of and I had a son that I needed to be with. So thinking of myself as an like, ever so competent multitasker, um, I thought I can do both at the same time. I could be both handyman and dad. So I, I placed Sam on that backpack and hoisted him onto my strapping five foot nine inch body and um, I began to work. I thought, like, this like, rugged dad can, can, can do both. And, and that morning, while Paula was away, I was committed that I was gonna like, get some tasks done and watch my child both at the same time. So, so I took Sam in the backpack and, and we went downtown, down, not downtown, but downstairs into the basement where we had a workbench. And there's something that I was gonna be working on there. I can't even remember what it was, but, Sam was there, and Sam has always been this like this gentle, compliant child, um, and really happy whenever he was bouncing around in that backpack that I had. But this particular day, he got cranky, and every time I at the workbench, I kind of leaned down to tighten a screw or to fidget with whatever I was doing with this gizmo, and he started to cry. And then when I when I leaned back up, he'd, he'd stop crying. And I thought maybe it was that the jerky mo- movements that I was doing, like down and back and forth, back and forth, making the stomach upset a little bit. And, um, but I leaned forward, and, and, and out would come the whimpers. And I leaned back, and then he'd stop crying again. And this went on for quite some time. And I thought, no, it's no big deal. Babies cry. Sometimes for no reason at all. They just, like, cry. So I wasn't really paying much attention to it. He'd, I'd lean forward. He'd cry for a few seconds. I'd lean back. He'd stop crying. And it almost like was choreographed, my last name. Um, uh, that's I wasn't even in my notes, so I'm, like, I'm rocking back and forth. Anyway, so Paula came home uh, sometime later. I was in the kitchen by then, upstairs, and, and, and Sam was in my backpack. By then, he had fallen fast asleep. And she said to me, well, like, what's that big red blotch on Sam's forehead? I don't know. Yeah. And she said, what, what do you mean, I don't know? She said, she said that, that, that mark wasn't on his head like when I left this morning. Like, did he, did he fall or something? I said, no, how could he fall? He's in the backpack the whole time. There's no way that Sam fell. She said, where were you? I was just in the basement. I was fixing something at the, at the workbench. I said, the funny thing was, like every time I was down there, when I, when I leaned forward, he'd start to cry. When I leaned back, like he'd stop. It was really weird. And I knew my wife, Paula, who's kind of a sleuth, this Sherlock Holmes knockoff or whatever, um, she always wanted to get to the why of things, which was usually unfortunate for me. <laughs> so she walked me downstairs and um, pointed to a, a, a lit light bulb hanging by a cord over the workbench. She said, Barry, do you think that every time you lean forward, um, his head might have been pressed against that light bulb? I don't know. But I said, you know, I fixed that thing I was trying to fix. She didn't seem to care about what I did if I didn't really care about who I'm with. So she, so she reached up, she turned off the light bulb. She took Sam, gently patted his head. Maybe, I can't recall, she might have put some ointment on there, this salve to make the, the pain and the red burn mark go away. She took pictures. <laughs> and, and after a few days, you know, burn mark crusted over, you get a little better and all that kind of stuff. But, and Paul and I, by the way, had a, had a, had a relational recalibration moment that, that, that morning. <laughs> so my first words to you this morning were these. Sometimes I get so focused on the goal of getting things done that I can be oblivious, oblivious to the people that are around me. And the Gospel of Mark tells a similar story. Although his story is like way better than mine. His is Holy Spirit inspired. Um, it's a story where Jesus and his disciples are out there doing their thing, and the disciples are so absorbed with the mission that they're on for the Messiah to under, uh, usher into this radical new kingdom that they did not see or care 
that Jesus was absorbed with people. So today and tonight's After Dark are the last in our series all year on spirit and story. I wanna thank Todd Pickett and the whole team in spiritual development for the incredible work they did this year on spirit and story. So this morning, um, we're gonna bring it home with one of those powerful and moving stories of the gospel. It begins with verse 21 and ends with verse 43 of the gospel of Mark. And it begins by saying, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, this large crowd gathered and, and pressed around him. And a man came up to him named Jairus. He was a synagogue ruler and he fell at Jesus' feet. And he pled with him, he said, my little daughter is dying, please come and put your hands on her so that she might be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. The story says this, this large crowd gathered and pressed around him and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had spent a great deal under the care of many doctors, had spent everything that she had, but instead of getting better, she grew worse. And so when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak because he thought, if I can just touch his clothes, I'm gonna be healed. And immediately her, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she had been freed from her suffering. And at once Jesus turned around in the crowd and, and he said, who touched my clothes? The disciples said, you see all these people crowding around you, yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept on looking to see who had done it. And then the woman realized what had happened to her. She came up and she fell at Jesus' feet and she, she told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you, go in peace be freed from your suffering. And while he was still talking, some men came from the house of Jairus and said, your daughter is dead. You know, why bother the teacher anymore? But ignoring what they said, Jesus turned to Jairus and he said, do not be afraid, just believe. Jesus didn't let anybody go with him except for Peter, James, and John. And they got to the house where Jairus lived and there was this large crowd outside of people crying and wailing loudly and Jesus said, like, like, while the commotion, this, this little girl, she's not dead, she's just asleep. So he put that crowd out and he went in to the house with the disciples and with the girl's parents. And he went and he took this little girl by the hand and he said to her these words, he said, Talitha kum, which means actually little lamb, arise, I say to you, get up. The story says that she got up and she began to walk around. And she was 12 years old. And Jesus said, I think it's time to give her something to eat. This isn't just a a story. This is actually a story within a story. Story of Jairus, this synagogue ruler. He came to Jesus, fell at his feet, and not long after that, another story begins, the story of this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. And then it gets back to the story of the ruler again. You know, the contrast is pretty striking when you hear that story, isn't it? Two very different people, this very prominent synagogue ruler and this anonymous, suffering, untouchable woman. This man, this woman, one was rich, one was poor. She wasn't just poor, she like was broke. Said she had spent everything that she had. One had a family. He had a wife, he had a daughter. The other one, we don't know if she had a family at all. One of them had a name. His name was Jairus. The other woman, her name isn't even mentioned. The number 12 factors into this story. She had been suffering for 12 years under the care of many doctors, but instead of getting better, she got worse. And Jairus' daughter is 12 years old. You know, know, the contrast in this story, it's, it's no coincidence. Jesus is saying that this is how wide my mercy is and everyone fits because both the prominent synagogue ruler and the desperate anonymous woman came and fell at Jesus' feet. That woman for, suffered for 12 years and I can't imagine how crudely she might have been treated by doctors 
And it's one thing to have like rough treatment and get better, but it's another to spend your money, be treated crudely to fix whatever was wrong, and then she only got worse. And it wasn't that she just didn't have any money. Like this, like, this woman was, was, was untouchable. If you go to Le- Leviticus 15, Leviticus 20, it says that anyone who touches a bleeding woman is deemed to be unclean. And so the fact is that this unclean woman reaches out and touches, touches Jesus. She said, if I can just touch his clothes, I'm gonna be healed. And Jesus knew he was touched because the power had gone out with him. She touched him. And instead of Jesus, the clean, becoming unclean, right? the gospel flips that completely upside down. Right? The, the unclean touching Jesus becomes clean. And remember I said like, it's, she didn't have a name? Well, actually, Jesus gave her a name. What do you call her? Daughter. It's the only place in the Gospels where Jesus calls anybody daughter. He gives this woman a name. So be encouraged, those of you who don't feel sometimes like you are a son or like you're a daughter. He said, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. They say, like, wait a second. What about Jairus? He got there first. Right? And he actually is a pretty important person. And he was kind of, he was patiently waiting in the background while Jesus stopped listening to him and started listening to this woman. And by the time he starts listening to Jairus again, it's too late because the guys came, right? These dudes from his house and said, you know, your daughter's not sick anymore. Now she's dead. And Jesus tells these busy disciples, you know, hey, we're going to Jairus' home. Then he gets to Jairus' home, there's a commotion outside, he puts them outside, they go inside. Remember this woman, the the, the unclean, touches Jesus, instead of Jesus becoming unclean, she becomes clean. Well, the same is true, they get in there, and here is this corpse, this dead girl, Leviticus 22, anyone who touches a corpse is deemed unclean. Jesus, the clean, touches the unclean, And instead of the clean becoming unclean, the unclean, the corpse, the dead body comes back to life and I can't imagine what it's like when she begins to blink and open her eyes and there sees the face of Jesus. It has to be this this, this, this harbinger of what we will face one, one day. So Jesus dispenses those crowds and he takes her by the hand and he calls her little lamb and he makes sure that she gets something to eat. Spirit and story, like, this is a story, and it's a story within a story. So I want you to have two takeaways today. First, be more interested in being like Jesus than in being like the disciples. Be more interested in Jesus who looks around than the disciples who look ahead. You know, sometimes, as I said in my opening line, I get so focused on getting things done that I'm oblivious to the people around me. And I read this story and I think, you know, hey, I'm a disciple of Jesus. But so often I find myself acting more like the disciples than I do like Christ. The disciples, those Jesus had poured his, himself into, they, they actually seemed rather uninterested in the woman and the man. They were so wrapped up on the fact that they were like this inner core of Jesus' like A team. And they hoped Jesus who they believed in was gonna start this, like, like this radical revolutionary movement against Rome, and they were gonna be agents of that movement. They were gonna be the Avengers in the ultimate end game, right? But that's not how Jesus rolled. When the woman who had been bleeding for a dozen years, when she snuck up behind Jesus, the story said she fell at his feet because she realized the power had gone out from him when he turned around and he said, who touched me? And the disciples said, you see all these people crowding around you, you say, who touched you? And then verse 11 has like, like 11, excuse me, verse 31 has, has these 11 powerful words. It says, you see the people crowding around you and you can see who touched me. And Jesus says these 11 words, but Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. You know, sometimes, Christians think being a disciple means joining a cause rather than becoming more like Christ. And sometimes as disciples we're more interested on being on mission than living missionally. 
And sometimes we act like discipleship is more big business ministry than it is loving the unloved. And sometimes our vision of discipleship is to change the world for Christ rather than touch someone like Christ to touch someone. The disciples were all about being this power team with this revolutionary agenda as insiders to the man. And they were ready to kind of jump in and be part of this political upending system and establish the Messiah's dynasty that would last forever. But Jesus also had an agenda, right, as the Messiah. And he was going about it a different way. The disciples said, you see all these people crowding around you, you can say who touched me, but Jesus kept on looking around to see who had touched him. So the disciples looked ahead and Jesus looked around and part of the confession is like that's one of my faults in life. I am way better at looking ahead than I am at looking around. So what does the story have to do with Sam in the backpack, his forehead singed by the dangling light bulb? Well, I guess in some ways I was like the disciple, right? Ambitious, focus, time management, getting things done, fixed on what was going on and what I was doing, a man on a mission. And Paula wasn't that way, you know, she steps in and she wasn't looking ahead, she was looking at a head, right? She was looking at Sam's head. Like, like noticing like the wound, the big red spot there and, and um, put an ointment on it. This mark on this boy whose head had been like burned. By the way, Sam's just fine today, all right? <laughs> don't, like, don't call social services like, on, uh, on me. Like, and I think there's a statute of limitations. It's been almost 20 years, so I'm, 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 that's expired. But... What it means for us as a Biola community that if we are a Jesus community, we've gotta be a looking around community. Disciples said, why are you looking around? There's a crowd of people everywhere. But Jesus knew that somebody had reached out and touched him and he wanted to find out who that person was. In this story, Jesus is saying that we need to be more about looking around at who we need to touch then looking forward at what we need to do. That's the first lesson I want you to hear from this Mark 5 spirit and story illustration. Be more interested in being like Jesus who looks around than the disciples who look ahead. Second lesson is this. There's only two lessons. Don't be too proud or too defeated to fall at the feet of Jesus. In this story, Jesus is demonstrating that like there's no pecking order in God's kingdom. Both came kneeling, right? The man from the rich family came and fell at Jesus' feet and pleaded earnestly with him. He said, my little daughter's dying. Please come and put your hands on him. And then the woman, realizing what had happened to her, she came and she fell at Jesus' feet and she told him the truth. There's something about falling at the feet of Jesus in our desperation that we need to take with great seriousness as followers of Christ. I think this past year I've probably had to drop to my knees before the Lord more than I have in a long time. Longing to be touched by Jesus because of some heartache or some disappointment or just the weight of burdens that seemed a little bit too heavy for me to carry alone. And sometimes, usually early in the morning, I would just sit and think and ponder and pray and read the scriptures And I'd be reminded of so many things. I'd be reminded of what Todd Pickett talked about last Wednesday, that sometimes there's a thorn in your side and you say, Lord, like remove this thorn from me. But if you don't remove it, remind me that your grace is sufficient. Or what Jesus said, you know, come to me all you who are burdened and are like heavy weighted and I'm gonna give you rest. So if you just take my yoke on you, you'll find like my yoke is is easy and my burden is, is light, and sometimes Jesus touched me at that point when I was ready to fall to my knees like like by some of you. Folks in this community who shared a word with me, encouraged me, colleagues that I work with, people that stopped to pray with me or say they were praying for me, send me a note of encouragement or even giving me a word from the Lord. 
And I've heard the words of God over and over again this past year saying, Barry, you are enough. Like, don't try to impress me with your successes. Don't try to impress me with what you've done. Don't try to take your failures as if you are a failure. You are enough. And as Philip Yancey says about God's grace, and we see the width of God's grace between that man and that woman, God's grace means there's nothing that you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing that you can do to make God love you less. You are enough, and God loves you deeply. And brothers and sisters, you are also sons and daughters. This is what Jesus calls you, and you are enough. And you need to hear that today. To get this across to you, you see how in Mark 5, Jesus is so much for you. Jesus stops for you, and he waits for you. And like the hound of heaven, he looks for you, and he calls you daughter, and he calls you son. And in this story, the Bible is showing you in no uncertain terms how wide is Christ's mercy. It's a story within a story. Two remarkably different people, socioeconomically, gender, family, physical ability, wealth. Jesus saying, like, that's how wide my grace is. You fit in the wideness of God's grace. Every one of you fits somewhere between that man and this woman. And there's a difference between working for Jesus and touching like Jesus. There's a difference between studying theology and helplessly falling at Jesus' feet. There's a difference between grasping the concepts of Jesus and being grasped by the mercy of Jesus. The disciples looked, but Jesus touched. St. Augustine says that flesh presses, but faith touches. The disciples were all about pressing flesh, but Jesus was about touching faith. And this is the gospel. In all of your mess, in all of your confoundedness, when you've been burned and bruised akin to that light bulb on Sam's head, Jesus notices you and he touches you, and he heals you. We used to sing a song on Sunday night's gospel song, like shackled by a heavy burden, beneath a load of guilt and shame, and then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. So students, it's almost over the semester. I know you're gonna finish strong, finals next week. Study night, Sunday night. I'm gonna be there serving you eggs. My, my prayer is like, as you finish, be reminded that Biola is a place where we fall. We fall in the best sense of the word. A place where we fall at the feet of Jesus and let him touch us. And the, the, whole, the whole idea is that this ruler whose name was Jairus means that there's no one that should be too proud to fall. And through this woman whose name was daughter, means that there's no one that should be too broken to fall. And so we fall. And even though it may look odd to those around us like it did to that pack of mission-driven disciples, we still fall at the feet of Jesus. That's what we do. Connor, get up there and start playing something spiritual, and really Christian, I'm done. So that's what Jesus does. That's the story. And that's the spirit of the story in Mark chapter five. No one is excluded from the wideness of God's mercy. And because Jesus touches us, we in turn touch others. This is Bio University at its best. Be touched by Jesus and touch like Jesus. The heart of Biola is to touch the world. We do this in LA, we do this up and down the west coast, we do it across the country. It's been in our blood, we do it to the least, we do it to the lost, we get our passports, we go abroad and touch the world. And we do this 
touching and sometimes it means that we have to touch the untouchable. But we don't have to, we get to. And that's our deep honor. When we touch like Jesus, instead of the clean becoming unclean, we see through the power of redemption, the work of the Holy Spirit, the healing nature of God, we see that the unclean become clean. But it also means we touch each other, not in a creepy way, but we touch each other. And we're here for each other. And sometimes in our fixation of looking ahead, Jesus said, you know, you gotta stop and look around for the one who is suffering or the one who is lonely or the one who maybe doesn't feel like she or he fits in here too well. We touch. And as mercy was extended to us, we extend mercy to others. Even at great cost, we do that. Even when it slows us down on our mission. And we do this not by looking ahead of us like the disciples, but we do this by looking around us like Jesus. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.